spoken word and written word are, are pretty different. Um, what you want to do is make sure that what you're writing feels true to you. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to welcome onto the show Peter Gazzardi. After a lifetime in book publishing, Peter Gazzardi has edited a remarkable group of diverse authors, from Stephen Hawking to Deepak Chopra, from Carol Burnett to Douglas Adams. Yet everything he'd learned from working with them felt oddly familiar. One day, it suddenly became clear. All that wisdom had, it, had its roots in a film he'd watched as a child, The Wizard of Oz. That revelation led to his first book, Emeralds of Oz, Life Lessons from Over the Rainbow. Deepak Chopra says, the nine emeralds in this book provide a powerful, near magical tool for navigating any difficult situation. I have been using them myself and my life is more effortless, spontaneous, and joyful. It's my great pleasure to have Peter with us today. So welcome, Peter. James, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. So share with us what's happening in your life just now. Oh, gosh. Um, I am after 40 years of serving as a midwife to all of these authors. I have finally uh, given birth to my own child. Um, <laughs> and what an experience it is. I, uh, the whole process was so instructive in so many ways. Um, and now, I mean, my, my empathy, which was always, I believe, fairly strong for the writers that I work with, is now amplified multiple times. This is such a tough thing to do, to write a book. And it's such a difficult thing once you've written the book, once you've found a publisher, once it's in the marketplace, to put air under its wings is really a project. Uh, so my heart, which is always full for my authors, has expanded, as I say, many, many fold. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a tough proposition being a writer out there. So take us back a little bit, because I mean, I find this incredible. You've, you've edited all these amazing books over the years, but the fact that this is your very first book un, you know, un, under, under your name, that, that kind of blows me away. So take, take us back. How did you get into the world, the, you know, the literary world, the world of editing? And was it, there's no point in those early beginnings you said, actually, I'm, I'm going to stop all this editing thing. I'm just going to focus on my own writing. No, um, I never really imagined myself. I always had a dream. I think maybe many editors have this kind of niggling thought that, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to be that person? Um, you know, I can't tell you how many bookstores I went to with Douglas Adams or Martin Amos or with uh, oh, Deepak Chopra, whatever it is. And, and I was the guy who would open the book to the flyleaf page and hand it to them, and then they would sign their names. You know, I'm, I'm their editor, I'm there to support them. Um, I never really imagined, maybe dreamed, but never imagined that it would be me sign, autographing these books for readers and answering their questions and having my photograph taken with them. Um, and it really wasn't anything that I aspired to particularly. Um, I, what I, I, you know, I've stick to what I'm good at, and I'm a good reader uh, because that's that's kind of what I've done ever since I was old enough to read. I was kind of a hid under the blankets when my mom told me it was time to go to bed with my flashlight and just read obsessively, compulsively, and still do. So I knew that that my work would involve something to do with reading. Um, and then I got a job at a book publishing house. Um, I, want, I was going to either try to be a journalist or work in book publishing. And journalism was really difficult. This was right after All the President's Men came out, this, this film about these heroic journalists and, and how they tracked, uh, they, they, they essentially toppled Richard Nixon, if you will. Um, but uh, so anyway, I got a job in book publishing and quickly realized I wanted to be involved with the books and the authors. 
Um, and that's, and, and I'm good at it. I mean, all you have to do to be good at it is to be a good reader uh, and, to, and to be, well, you have to be a number of things. You have to be a therapist, you have to be a reader, you have to be a diplomat, um, you have to enjoy working with difficult people. Um, you have to be able to marshal uh, the team on the publishing house behind your book. You have to be able to do a lot of good things, a lot of things. But but I found I was I was I was pretty good at, at all of that. So that became my life for for the better part of forty years in book publishing. So for some people that don't know about that, the role of the the editor, um, my understanding is that editors come in different flavors. Um, that's types of that's, so, so you know describe you know the, often the different the different types of editors you will often be work or a writer will be working with. And where do you fit into that? Do you have a particular role that you take as an editor? Well, that's a terrific point. Um, a terrific question. Uh, I think mostly when people think of editors, they think of what we know in the trade as copy editors, um, which are the people who kind of come up behind an author when an author has completed their work and tidy up the manuscript, make sure the grammar is okay, make sure that the characters' names are spelled consistently, um, just to just tidy it up. That's not the kind of editing I do, and, and I'm not even particularly good at that. Um, what I'm, I'm what's called a structural editor. So I work with the author early on. Uh, they might have a draft of the manuscript or even a couple of chapters, and I would be brought in to, to help. You know, so what's working, what's not working, uh, what can we build on, what should we pair away? Uh, maybe the idea that the author thinks is the heart of the book, maybe there's something even more interesting, kind of a layer or two below that. So I'm, the, I'm, I'm kind of, I act as, the, as, as a reader, as an intelligent, hopefully, reader, uh, to work with the author to figure out where the best book lies in the work that they're doing and how we can get there together. So how does that relationship begin? Is it, are you contacted by the publisher, say we've, we've signed this author and now we need someone like you to, to as you said, midwife this baby into the world? Um, or are you being working very much early on directly that a, a writer reaches out to you and said, Peter, I'd love for you to edit my book. And then when that relationship starts, is it, do you normally just kind of get together in person, spend a few days together, or is it a series of emails or calls? What, what, is, what is the beginning of the relationship look like? Well, it, it varies, but it mostly begins with a publisher who's made a sizable investment in a book. Usually they've sunk a lot of money into a book. And fairly frequently, it's a first-time author, although not always. Um, and, uh, and the the publisher has some kind of a sense that the book could use more than the usual amount of shepherding. Mm -hmm. um, no disrespect intended. I mean, maybe it's a first time author. Maybe it's, um, oh, maybe they've read a first draft that they're not crazy about. Um, maybe they've read a third or fourth or fifth draft. Uh, I worked with a, recently with an author who, whose book had kind of languished at the publishing house for seven years and they tried many ways to, to fix it uh, and it kind of given up hope. Um, and sent me the manuscript and said, what do you think? Um, and I said, yeah, I, I can see a way to fix this. I can see what to do. Um, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. But, um, and then there are the, the rarer cases where the agent, who's just sold the book for a lot of money, realizes maybe the author's last book was late, maybe they struggled, maybe it's their first book again, and brings me in early, early on. Okay, we've sold the book we've got from a proposal, but I know this person's going to need help um, crafting it, and uh, maybe you could join us early on in this process. Now, working with all these different authors, you mentioned like you know, Douglas Adams, obviously the Stephen Hawking's incredible. Um, you know, we think we think of these these books or the Deepak Choppers. You know, there there are many many of our, our bookshelves. Um, but I'm I'm interested as you were kind of going through and working with all these different authors, you noticed a uh, um, a pattern that was kind of going through them, um, and you know, it, it clicked for you. Said, okay, I, I recognize this pattern. I recognize this. I'm seeing this multiple times here in, in the, the good book. So can you tell us about that, that aha moment that you got and recognize yes. that pattern? Yes. Um, it was, I was visiting a publisher um, that I do a, a fair amount of work with, with HarperCollins. And, and there on the publisher's bookshelf was the 75th anniversary edition of The Wizard of Oz. 
with Judy Garland, this amazing look uh, on her face. And for some reason, in that moment, I had this, this kind of epiphany. I just thought to myself, I work with all these very bright authors. Some of them, there's a lot of wisdom that I've kind of rubbed elbows up against, if you will. Um, but anything I might have learned from these brilliant folks was right there in a film that I first watched when I was 11 years old. And it just struck me in that it just was a light bulb going off. And I happened to mention it to the publisher that, uh, while I was in the room. I have a tendency to blurt, uh, and I blurted. And he said, uh, he was very enthusiastic. I, said, that's, I think that's a great idea. Why don't you write that up as a proposal? I'd be interested. So I did, and I found an agent, and she quickly sold it to Harper. And that began a long odyssey of trying to find my way home uh, as I wrote this book. It took an awfully long time um, and an awful lot of work. So this Wizard of Oz, this, this person that's going on a journey, obviously we go way back, you know, you've got the, the Iliad and, and book, books, obviously works like that as well. Uh, I think of the work of like Joseph Campbell, you know, the, yes. as me, so this is, there's something in, 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 it's almost in us as humans, this mythology that we want to go on these adventures uh, yes. as, as well. So, I mean, I, I'm thinking as you were starting to, uh, to map this out, take us along the, that yellow brick road. Take us take it along the steps, the the steps or the stages that you find you you saw repeated in these great books. Well, you you latched onto the hero's journey, which I think Dorothy embarks on in this film. Um, and that, when I started thinking about that, it just seemed that this this film is so rich, uh, and I continue to feel that way. After I've written my book, I talk to people about it, and they make comments where I realize there are layers and layers and layers still unexplored in that film. It's just it's just a remarkable film. Um, but what I, I honestly I struggled. I had this idea, and then I struggled to actually realize it. How does Stephen Hawking's work? relate to Dorothy Gale in Kansas. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. I just had this intuitive hit that it, it was connected somehow. And finally, what I ended up doing was distilling the book, to, essentially telling a little bit about my life story and how it is that I came to be involved with writers and writing and to be so passionate about it. Um, and then just dove right into the film. Um, not so much the book, but the film, which is, which is the, what speaks to me, um, to talk about the wisdom that's in it. Uh, and the wisdom itself, I, I leave it maybe to the reader to figure out how that wisdom connects with these particular authors. But it's the wisdom itself that the book is about, especially these nine emeralds of wisdom. And I make the case that, that Dorothy Gale uh, made a journey, a circuit, if you will, through nine little stages, nine, nine epiphanies that she had on her journey. And each of these, to, uh, working together, they, they shrank her obstacles, like the Wicked Witch of the West under her bucket of water. They dissolved her obstacles so that this young girl went from being peripheral and helpless and frightened to being you know, centered and competent and powerful uh, by the end of this story. So this this journey um, that she was going on, I, I was wondering, as you were writing the book or thinking, and I don't know whether this is, it was different from the proposal you put in as opposed to the book you ended up writing, who was the ideal reader? Like Stephen, Stephen King often he said, you know, have your ideal reader in mind. Was yeah. the ideal reader that you wrote the start that you did the book proposal for the same as the ideal reader at the end of the book? Oh, that's a great question. I have, I have made my daily living by believing that I am the, a typical reader. So, for instance, at working with Stephen Hawking, I didn't understand much, if not most, of what he had to say at the beginning of that manuscript, of that process of working with him on that manuscript. So I used my ignorance, as I tend to do, as my, as my most powerful tool, which is to say, I just keep asking questions until I understand it. And if we can then breathe that information into the manuscript, then we've got a book that's going to speak to lots of people. Hmm. So that's how I've worked with authors. And I just hoped in this case that if it was interesting to me, that it would be interesting to readers. Um, 
that's as I get closer, got closer to the publication and we start thinking about marketing and putting labels on the book, um, then it becomes, it's nonfiction, of course, it becomes self-help, it becomes uh, spiritual self-help. Can, it has, can, can, I, can, I can almost imagine the, in the, the, the marketer at the publishing company going, <laughs> <laughs> because wow. it's like, yeah. It's like the, the marketer of publishing company, whoever got you know, a brief history of time, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking's book. Like, I, so I'm marketing a book on physics to, to the average <laughs> labor analysis. <laughs> so, you know, were there some difficult conversations with those publishers? Um, the, that I've worked with on my books? You yeah, mean? On the, especially on the marketing side, not so much maybe the, the, the editorial team. Um, no because um, either I picked or, or the marketplace picked. So if I'm working, either I acquired the books when I was working at a publishing house and I acquired Stephen Hawking's book partly because Stephen was so well known in his field that he was a crown prince of astrophysics. Mm. So that might not mean much to you and me, but I knew also that Stephen loved the limelight. He'd already had a wonderful article in Vanity Fair. He was on the cover of the New York Times uh, magazine. Um, so I knew that he, he loved the spotlight and I knew the spotlight loved him, that the media was drawn to his story. Um, so, so, and that, that was true of Deepak. Deepak already had a large fall. I mean, it, it, it was specific to meditation and to Ayurvedic medicine, uh, but he had a large following already. Um, so I didn't have that difficult to task that I have for myself. I mean, nobody knows who the heck Peter Gazzardi is. Um, and, uh, and that's what editors do. They, t they don't step center stage. They're the person behind the scenes working to make the book happen. So it's been a heavy lift to bring the book into the public eye. Uh, and that's why it's so wonderful that you and I are talking uh, and you will help me do that. Um, so take, 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 no, take yeah. those, 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 these nine gems that you found them because, yes. um, you often know, like for example, the wizard of Oz, first I think of, you know, the old new world, uh, the Kansas, you know, she's in Kansas there and it's, and it's, it's all looks like normal. And then she goes into this other, other place. Yes. And then the, the role of the, um, of the straw man and the, you know, the, yes. the ally, Tim, Tim yes. Mets, you know, Tim, yes. Mets. So take, take us through these, these gems and, and maybe okay. as you take, okay. I would love to know from some of the books that we, we have made, we have read like Douglas Adams or the Deepak Chopra's uh, examples of that, that you've, you found that you can, Oh, that's, that's, that's that, that's there. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, boy, you've asked, you asked great and challenging <laughs> questions, but let me quick run, make a circuit through the nine emeralds and then we'll pick up from there. Um, so the first emerald is listen to your longing and each one is connected to an iconic moment in the film. So listen to your longing, whatever issue you James are facing or any of your audience members are facing in their lives. The first step is to ask yourself, what do I long for? What outcome do I long for? Not just what I want, certainly not what other people expect of me or what I'm in the habit of doing. But deeper than that, what do I long for uh, from this situation, this outcome? And once you start to access what your longing is, then you're oriented. You know, then you have a sense of how to go forward to achieve your goal, to address the issue that you're facing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the second one um, is see it as if for the first time. And that's the moment when Dorothy steps into Kansas, the farmhouse that has been picked up by this cyclone and she's been in it for a day and, she, and it lands suddenly in this technicolor world. The world shifts from black and white to technicolor. Uh, and in that moment, she could be, she, she sees it, the, she has this amazing look of wonderment on her face and where she could be judgmental or frightened, she meets these munchkins, then she meets all these strange characters. She's not, she's, she is uh, what they call, be she's stepping into beginner's mind in Buddhism. They call it this sense of, of, of that everything is miraculous. You look at the world as if you were a child or a baby, seeing it for the first time and realizing what a miracle it is. 
That's the second thing you do. So look at whatever issue you are facing as if for the first time. Set aside what you think you know, and oh my gosh, it always turns out this way, or now set that aside. Just look at it, you know, be in this moment and look at it with fresh eyes. So that's the second one. The third one is to um, celebrate yourself just for showing up. This is a big one. This is what Dorothy, Dorothy is, steps into this world. Uh, she meets this good witch, Glinda, and then suddenly she's surrounded by these, these tittering munkin, munchkins who are, who are just enraptured by her, right? They have a parade, they sing songs. Um, and, and what has she done to earn this adulation? I mean, absolutely nothing. All she did was show up. You know, her house happened to land on the Wicked Witch of the East, killing her, liberating the oppressed Munchkin people. They're delirious with joy. But the message for you and me, the lesson we take away from this is celebrate yourself. Give yourself a parade just for showing up, just for being there. This kind of puts air under your wings in whatever situation it is that you're facing. Um, the fourth one is choose compassion. Compassion is the key that unlocks Dorothy's progress. This smooths the way on the yellow brick road. She, she meets this, this scarecrow who talks. Uh, and, and what does she do? She says, you know, how can I help? And she eases him off this post that he's uncomfortably nailed to. And she does this again and again. The tin man, she applies oil to his rusty joints. The, 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 the cowardly lion, she says, come join us. We're going to see this wizard. Maybe he can give you the courage that you, you desire. Um, so she uses compassion to ease her way. And, and I say that, so you, your fourth step is choose compassion for yourself, for the situation that you're facing, whatever it may be. And then for the people around you who are involved in the situation, see their, put it, see it as if you were in their shoes for a moment. And this kind of opens, it, it, you shift inside, when, especially around the fourth emerald, choose compassion. Um, the fifth one is realize that you already possess what you desire most. And this is a, this is a difficult one to accept, uh, at least for me. I think you'll find when you run through the nine that some come easily to you and some take a little more work. You have to chew on them a little longer to mix metaphors. But in this case, you know, for me, I've, I've dealt all my life with anxiety and panic attacks and just fears, right? And so for me, this is an invitation to recognize that I already possess what I desire most, which is courage, right? Um, forgive me, that's my phone, which I should have turned off. Um, uh, that, that, that's that's, a, that's a, a publisher on the phone just now, worried about an author that's not delivered their, 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 their draft on time. <laughs> right. And they can wait another half hour. It'll be okay. Um, so the point, oh, we were at the fifth hour. So realize you already possess what you desire most. In this case, in my case, it's courage. Now, that's really what I want most. Uh, and, and, and I possess courage. You know, we all do. It's just a matter of getting in touch with that courage inside ourselves and doing that more and more frequently. And suddenly that courage becomes more available to us you know, in whatever situation we're facing. So that's five. Six is face what you fear. So Dorothy goes right to the castle of the Wicked Witch of the West and faces her. She has to in order to get her broomstick, in order to get the wizard to help her return home to Kansas. But this is an invitation to, to stop. We're all, we all feel those footsteps kind of coming up behind us uh, metaphorically in life. And this is an invitation to stop and turn around, it's very difficult, it's kind of counterintuitive, turn around and look at that thing you're afraid of. And suddenly it will, it shrinks, you know, it, 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 it becomes much more manageable. Um, the seventh is pull back the curtain uh, and, and see things as they really are. You know, this is, we all tend to tell, we, 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 we're storytellers as human beings and we all tend to dramatize uh, the events in our lives. So I'm going for a job interview uh, and I, I'm telling myself, if I don't get this job, I'm going to be living in a cardboard box, you know, under a, a, a bridge somewhere. Um, so you, we, we, we all tend to do this to kind of uh, 
get kind of get kind of overwrought about the different things we're facing. This is an invitation to pull back the curtain on all those stories you're telling yourself and look at what's really there. And again, suddenly it becomes more manageable. Um, and eight and nine are eight is you've got the power. This is Glinda coming to Dorothy towards the end of the film. You've got the power. You've had it all along. You just have to click those ruby slippers together um, and you can go back to Kansas. Um, and we all have that power. We all have power. We, we tend to give it away. We tend to bestow it on other people. But this is an invitation to realize that the power is within us. We possess it to take it back from those people we're giving it to. And that doesn't work as a strategy. You've got to do this yourself and you've got what you need. Um, and the ninth one is there's no place like home. And, and this, is, this is a great one. It's a rich one. It's, it, it's a very spiritual one. And this is, um, you know, in the film, this is what Dorothy tells herself, her mantra as she clicks those ruby slippers together and, and gets back to Kansas. Uh, but, but the bottom line here is there's no, there is no place like home, but it's not a physical space. It's the space, it's a space inside you. Uh, and you have it, James, and I have it. And it is also a space in which we can meet. We are all interconnected. And this does come back to Stephen Hawking and the way that things are connected on this subatomic level. And little tiny shifts that you make um, can have effects at tremendous distances. Um, it's called entanglement in physics. Uh, but there are all kinds of indications in particle physics of the ways in which everything is interconnected. This was his quest for the grand theory of everything, right? Uh, and it's all connected to there's no place like home. And that also, so that's, also connects that's with that, that circular, that also connects with some of your work with Deepak Chopra as well, because I can hear some of those themes coming in. in some, yes. um, I, think, I think Abundance was one of the books I remember reading. Uh, yes. So I can, I can hear some of those themes as, as they, kind of, they, they go on. Um, fascinating. So, so going, going around, I, I, I'm interested to know with some of these, these authors that you, you, uh, you've worked with, um, you mentioned working with difficult people. Um, <laughs> so, uh, tell me, you know, the, 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 the flavors, I mean, I, I often think about an author who's, you know, getting up every morning, they're, they're maybe sitting down from seven in the morning until 11 in the morning religiously and, and, and they can do that. But I think maybe some of the authors that you, you, you work with, they're, they're often known for other th things. They're known for being the academic or in the case of Deepak Chopra being a s uh, speaker, teacher, um, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, when you work them, how do you approach them? The, the the kind of nuts and bolts of getting this thing done, getting this book written. If they're not the 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 the, the workman of the going or work person going to work every morning and spending that four hours in the morning. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, they, I cannot give them motivation. You know, that motivation does have to come from inside. I mean, Douglas Adams was a particular challenge in that regard. Uh, Douglas used to say, uh, uh, he, was, he, used to, he was very fond of saying, I love deadlines. You know, I love the whooshing sound they make when they go by, uh, <laughs> and, which is wonderfully entertaining, brilliant, and very Douglas. Uh, and if you're the person waiting for him to deliver a manuscript, um, it's a challenge. So with Douglas, I mean, you, each person is different. And with Douglas, it was really a matter of spending time with him. Uh, he had a wonderful editor in England as well. Um, she really did the, the, often the lion's share of the work. But I would step in from time to time, visit him, spend time, have fun with him. Uh, and we'd set up an arrangement where, you know, I would want to, I'd see pages. You know, Douglas, go back to your office. I'm going to sit in your living room for the next couple of hours. And I can't wait to see what you produce at the end of, of that couple of hours. And so he would bound up the stairs and get to work. Uh, and, and one of the wonderful things is that Douglas loved to kind of, he'd come up with something really funny and they'd want to share it with someone. I think that went back to his BBC days of working on the radio with working in a kind of communal uh, environment. So he would, you know, he would dash back down the stairs in 20 minutes and say, what do you think of this? I, isn't this great? Uh, and it was inevitably great. So it was just a matter of, in his case, of coaxing and coaxing and coaxing and, and making it fun. 
Uh, but for you know unlocking that 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 key that 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 keyhole that, that lock with every author is a little bit different. Um, and 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 generally they've got to be motivated, and and often they're motivated because they've been paid a great deal of money, and they're going to have to return that money if they don't deliver this manuscript. <laughs> that's always that's always a very, very, very good motivation. I mean, as you, as you're talking, I'm often thinking about this idea of creative peers. How you often find people do very creative work. They will have a an, another person, um, uh, you know, alongside. I'm thinking of you know. Uh, Darwin, his wife was that was that other person, or you'll often see that you know the other person is kind of you know pushing them along and helping them on on that journey as well. Um, obviously, a, a common thing you you, you hear uh, when it comes to writers and, and and creatives of all sort is creative block. Um, so I'm guessing with some of the authors you, you've worked with, maybe the you know the, the the financial side is a good good way of pushing them. But any, any advice for those people that maybe are part of the way through a piece, they're, they're, they're writing that, that first draft or they're, they're working on that screenplay and they've just hit a bit, of a bit of a wall. What do you do to get unstuck? What advice do you give to, to authors and, and creatives to get unstuck? Well, I think this is <laughs> Emerald uh, number three. Celebrate yourself for just showing up. I do think you have to just show literally show up for a certain number of hours every day um, and sometimes that will involve just looking out your window um, and thinking um, and this is but that's part of it too you know just gestation just showing up and thinking about what you want to do maybe scribbling down some notes maybe not um, within a few days you'll have something you want to write about um, and just just giving yourself kind of free reign to write what is probably going to be crap. I mean, just to put it bluntly, it, it's not going to show up anywhere in the final manuscript, but it's, you have to just get it down. You have to blurt it out. You have to throw it onto the paper uh, in order to the following day, read it and see like, is there a germ of an idea here? Um, are there a couple of good sentences? Is there a new direction that I'm starting to see emerging? Um, you've got to give yourself license. And this is very difficult and extremely difficult for an editor who's, who makes a living by setting the bar really high. Uh, you've got to give yourself permission to just write bad stuff, um, just, to, just to open things up, just to get things moving. So what about the, the, those, those um, let's say, thought leaders, the people who, whether in the, maybe not, maybe not so much in the academic side, but maybe they're in other fields or the speakers, for example, who the written word, they love reading, but the written word does not come easy in terms of creating. That's not how they, they find it easiest to communicate their ideas. And I'm thinking about here, if you go obviously way back, you would have scribes. You would have people who mm -hmm. job it was to write, you know, the person would be, and I think in, even of, in more kind of pulp fiction, you know, the Barbara Cartlands of this world who mm -hmm. would just speak out their ideas and someone would be writing it. Mm -hmm. Do you work with authors like they, that's, their, that's their preferred way of, of communicating and getting these ideas out of their head? Um, not usually. Um, and I've tried it myself uh, when it was difficult for me to write this book. I, would, I just tried speaking into a microphone and then cleaning it up, getting it transcribed and working from it. I think if you're stuck, that's an approach to take to get yourself freed up. But for me, it didn't work terribly well. Um, I find that spoken word and written word are, are pretty different. Um, what you want to do is make sure that what you're writing feels true to you, that it feels real and genuine and conveys kind of who you are and how you feel. And you're not kind of putting on airs for for the reader, if you will, you're not you're not kind of caught up in some artificial um, place or artificial form that you want to convey. Like, be real, be genuine. Once you've written it down and you're happy with it, then by all means, speak it. You know, mm -hmm. read it out loud, and you'll find ways to kind of make it to trim it and to make it even more fluid. Um, but so what, you, what you're talking about there is actually helping that all the really find their voice if they haven't yet found. The yes, 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 voice. yes, absolutely. That, that, that has to happen 
early-ish on um, in, in terms of pr productivity and production. And that was very difficult for me to do. Uh, it, my, my, it was stilted. I, I, I'm also, I guess, more fundamentally for me, I'm not a guru. So who am I to write a book about wisdom, right? Um, so that's, that's a profound question. That's the kind of question that authors come up against. So who are you to write this book? What makes you think? Where did that hubris come from that somebody's going to read this? Well, so that forces you to get down to an authentic place inside you where you are vulnerable, where you are real with yourself and finally with the reader. And where I came to in this book is, no, I'm not a sage by any means. I am, I am having just as difficult a time struggling through this life as you are. But I've, I've discovered a few things in the course of my struggles that I think have, have proven helpful to me and I think might prove helpful to you. And I found a way of conveying them because they, they, I located them in this very popular film. And so I found a way of conveying them that might also be fun and helpful to you. And, and I hope you'll give it a try. Um, so, and, so, that's, so that's almost a little bit like, like the reporter model, going back to your, you know, all the president's men of actually being able to see these are the things I've, these are the things I've discovered. You, you put it in a, a format, you've seen from these other people, what they, how they're doing it and then saying, and this is my interpretation. This is, this is my, uh, my take right. on this is this is what I right. have important. This is what you need to focus on. Right. Um, and I think there's an element of compassion that comes into that. The fourth emerald, choosing compassion. Choosing compassion for myself. Like, let, let's be real with uh, who am I and what have I struggled with and what have I learned? And compassion for my reader. You know, I know that, that life can be difficult for you sometimes as well. So we're in this together. Uh, I'm going to walk these miles through this book in your shoes and my shoes. We're gonna do this together. And hopefully I can convey some of what I've learned and hopefully it will be helpful to you. And that's, that's what seems genuine to me. So that and when I finally found that voice and that stance, then, then I was able to write the book in a way that worked. So I'm gonna ask you perhaps a difficult question to ask any lover of, of books and, and reading. <laughs> if there was one book that you could recommend to anyone that's listening or watching this just now, not one of your own books, but a, a book on perhaps on how to write, uh, how, how to, to get that, those ideas out of your head into some, into that book form. Uh, what book would you, would you recommend for those aspiring or even, or even professional writers just now? Maybe they, they reread. Yeah. You mentioned Stephen King's book uh, on writing. Um, and I found that very helpful. Um, I, I think the book I'd like to write next is probably a novel. I would like to try my hand. Out. That's on my bucket list, you know, to write fiction. Um, and, uh, and his book is particularly geared to people who are interested in writing fiction. And I find he asks all kinds of provocative questions that, that are, are really helpful. Um, and he has a passion for what he's doing that's contagious. And what about the, the going to the more digital tools? Is there an online tool or an app you find very useful, uh, soft piece of software you find very useful in doing the work that you do? No, no, there really isn't. I just use uh, Microsoft. I, I use Word um, to track changes and all of that so that the author can see towards the end of the process. Well, I embed my queries in the text um, so the author can see what I'm thinking. And then towards the end of the process, I will do a heavy line edit. I'll work on it kind of sentence by sentence. And I want the author to see what I've done. Sometimes they'll like it. Mostly they'll like it, but sometimes they'll say, no, 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 that's my favorite sentence. <laughs> you can't cut that out. Um, and, uh, and that's great. That's a give and take process. But I don't really rely. I mean, partly it's because I'm nearly 70 and it's just, that's just not my medium. You know, my 17 year old daughter's on her phone all the time. She might have a good answer, but also I, I just don't, I think so much of this happens inside your head. You know, um, I just can't imagine, you know, what's the app for getting into your heart and your head. Um, I think they, they haven't invented that one. I'm sure someone, whoever invents that's going to make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> what about music? If you to recommend one piece of music to our audience, uh, I don't know if you have music on when you write, whether that. Oh, uh, no, no. Well, see, again, it's a generational thing. The only music I can have on when I'm editing or writing is classical music. Once lyrics are introduced, I get, I get caught up in the lyrics and I've lost my, my train of thought. Um, it seems like my kids can do that. I, 
I don't know. I didn't think the human brain was capable of, of multitasking in that way, but perhaps it is. I'm still skeptical, to be honest. So is, is there one piece of music you would recommend, either the piece, like a classical piece that... Like I mean, I'm a rock and roll fan. Um, I think maybe my favorite album of all time is, is Bop Till You Drop by, by Ry Cooter. Um, there's a, a man named John Hyatt, uh, an old rocker who's who's absolutely a genius. He did an album called Slow Turning, which has some of my favorite songs on it. Um, yeah, we'll put all these links here for, for everyone as well. Um, and finally, a final question uh, for you, Pete. I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So you have all the skills, all the knowledge you have acquired over the years. But no one knows you. You know no one. You have no connection, no editors, no, uh, no uh, publishers, no literary agents, no one. Mm -hmm. would you, how would you restart things? You know, I think my talent, if, if you can use that word, what, what, I, what I am is a reader. You know, I'm a good reader. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I, I had polio when I was a, a child as a toddler. Um, and, and to overcome my physical limitations, I just, I immersed myself in the world of books. So from a very early age, books have been my lifeline. I, I'm not alone in this. I know lots of people feel this way. But perhaps it was particular, that a particular urgency for me uh, because of my childhood illness. But, um, so it would have to be something involving um, that skill. Like I can help whoever's writing something make that writing better. I can help them figure out what they're trying to say. I can figure out, help them figure out what's working, what's not working, what we need to build on, what we need to jettison. And then I can help them sentence by sentence kind of make it more, again, more, more urgent. You know, how do we simplify these sentences? How do we use active verbs in, in every case? And how do we make it, how do we alternate short, punchy, staccato sentences with longer sentences that have lots of clauses just for variety? I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm good at. So I'd have to find a way to help people. It could be, you know, medical writing. It could be whatever writing is, is that, that somebody is making money from. I would have to sell myself as somebody who could help them make money from their writing because I can help you make it better, more effective. And um, Peter, where's the best place if people want to go and learn more about the book, learn more about you, your writing, um, where's the best place for them to go and do that? Uh, so I have a website, Peter Gazzardi. I, I, have, I do have that technological, um, uh, that, that technological advance serves me. Um, it's Peter Gazzardi, P-E-T-E-R-G-U-Z-Z-A-R-D-I.com. Um, and in that website, I talk a little bit about the authors I work with and, and I'm kind of uh, doing the editorial thing. And also there's a big chunk of it dedicated to the book. Um, and you can get there also through emeraldsofoz.com. Uh, emeraldsofoz.com. Emeralds of Oz. Um, yeah. com. And we'll put all these links here so everyone can go and get access to those things. Peter, thank, thank you so much for coming on today. It's really fascinating learning about this uh this journey that you've gone on as a, oh, as a wow. and, and, and it's just, um, it gives me huge hope. <laughs> um, you know, as someone that's, that's often been behind the scenes like you have, you know, in, in, in the world of publishing, I've been world behind the scenes of, in the world of entertainment for many years. And then it is possible, regardless what age you are, to, to go and, and publish that first book. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh, today. thank you, James. I, I love this interview. I love the conversation. Um, you've got a wonderful mind. You've asked me great questions. So I'm sure that you'll prosper in each and everything that you do. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.